Welcome to the Nate KG Podcast, a show dedicated to exploring the nuances of jump rope, where I talk with jumpers of all skill levels, backgrounds, and fitness goals. In this episode, I talk with Rachel Jablo. You can find her on Instagram at get underscore roped or on the web at getroped.com. Rachel coaches jump rope classes full-time in Chicago, spreading the jump rope flow and helping her clients make some serious fitness gains. As we discussed during our conversation, Rachel's drive to pick up a rope really started with utility. She wanted to get the most impactful workout done in the least amount of time. Of course, she was hooked after she started, as were the rest of us. We talk about this at length and many other subjects, including advice for somebody starting a fitness class, changes in the fitness industry, dry needling, muscle recovery, overcoming nervousness as a coach, and a whole lot more. Pop over to natekg.com for this episode's show notes. And now, let's get into this conversation with Rachel Jablo. Rachel, how's it going? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for being on the show. I'm really excited and we have uh, we have a lot to jump into right now. I know. Me too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I think a um, cool place to kind of get get moving here is probably a little bit of a history um, on you. And actually, selfishly, I'm a little curious because we haven't spoken too, too much yet. So I really kind of want to know about where sports fall in your life and kind of how that's um, evolved into jump rope. Sure. Sure. Well, I just have to say it's such a great Instagram community that we have this, you know, we were able to connect like this. Um, you know, there are so many people that you see every day online and you don't really get to learn more about them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool that we're doing this. Yeah. Um, you know, I definitely admire and watch the, you know, all the tricks that you do with the jump rope and, you know, behind my phone and secretly wishing I could do most of those. <laughs> Thank you. I um, appreciate that. I can teach you all of them for sure. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I'm going to take you up on that. Yes. Sure. Um, so anyway, I grew up a pretty um, sports oriented family. Um, I grew up on the East Coast in um, right outside DC in Maryland. And, um, you know, I, my parents sort of threw us all, me and my brother and sister into trying everything. And, um, for me, what stuck was, um, figure skating. So from a young age, I think maybe around eight years old, I started figure skating and I just loved it. And I think a part of me loved it because, um, as much as I loved team sports, cause I did, I played soccer, I played softball, I played basketball. I can't say I was really good at any of them, <laughs> but, um, I've always been very active and very athletic. Um, but for some reason, skating was like that personal challenge, um, that I could continuously compete with myself, which I think somehow relates, you know, to the jump rope now, which we can get to later. But, um, so I started figure skating probably around eight and, um, I did that through my first year of college. Um, and very long that time. really, yeah, it was a long time. Um, I think, you know, it was, I look back and it's kind of tough to have a focus, like a, be really focused the way that one should, if you want to, you know, go professional in the sport, um, at such a young age, you sort of need your, you know, your parents to guide you and push you if they see that you have the talent to do that. And so I look back kind of, you know, wishing that I had been pushed more or maybe my parents didn't push me more because either they didn't see that I had the dedication at the time. I'm not sure, but, or the talent, but, um, but I loved it. And, um, I did it basically, um, through high school. I did it every morning. I was at the rink at five and every afternoon I was at the rink at three. Um, and, but 5am and 3pm. Yeah. Wow. So okay. it was a big part of my life. Um, but, you know, I can also look back and say I never felt that I missed out on anything in terms of my social life, in terms of friends and birthday parties. I, you know, obviously, if I had a competition or something on the weekends, I would miss whatever was going on. But um, I was as much as I loved skating and looked forward to it every day and, you know, challenged myself, I also very much, 
I was very social and I didn't want skating to be my life. And I think that's sort of where um, I came to those crossroads um, at, in college when I went to school. There happens to be no um, scholarships for figure skating anywhere. Uh -huh. Kind of like jump rope. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, you they have these sort of ridiculous things where you, quote, compete for the school for points or something. Some ridiculous thing. I don't even know how for it works. Points? But like just yeah, respect I points? Really, or? <laughs> I still don't really know how the points – or how the, why the points would even matter. But because there's no funding for it, I guess obviously that's wow. why there's no um, – scholarships but I happen to know um, my coach um, in Maryland knew the coach at Ohio State so that's one of the reasons I went there and um, you know it's such a big school and it's a big 10 and the football and the partying and all that stuff that I it was really hard to balance everything like it you know I was able to balance it in high school and then when I got to college I kind of you know, checked out, I was going to skating at 5am in the morning and then, you know, going to classes all day and then staying up all night to try to have my social life and then not sleeping and going right to skating. And it just wasn't going to work for an extended period of time. Yeah, that sounds like so, a recipe for burnout. <laughs> totally. And I wasn't loving it anymore because obviously it wasn't conducive to my life. And I guess at that point, luckily I wasn't getting a scholarship for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. I probably would have been pissed if I, you know, dropped it at that point. But I do, I love it and I still love it. I don't get to do it as often as I'd like. But that was my way into um, fitness and, you know, led to off ice training and, you know, being in a gym and being healthy, all that stuff from you know, a very young age. So that was really the catalyst that kind of got you into just staying healthy and fitness in general. That and my parents have always been into fitness and mm -hmm. health and my parents have always been active. They're still, you know, they're both almost 70 and, you know, my mom works out every single day. Um, oh, wow. yeah, she's in phenomenal shape. My dad, you know, either goes to the gym or, you know, I mean, he's active in whatever he does. Um, knock wood, you know, I'm super lucky to have such healthy parents. Just out of curiosity, what are the, what are their workouts or their activities? Um, my mom is, so it's crazy, but both my parents have had, um, double hip replacements. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they're still my active mom, every day. Every day. Sounds um, like you've got some good genes. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. My mom was um, a ballet dancer for most of her life. Okay. And um, until she had kids, um, so I'm, um, you know, that's where hers stemmed from. And now she, because of her hips, she built one of those endless pools in the house. Mm -hmm. So she swims every day, and she does a lot of, you know, strength training as well. Um, and my dad, he goes to the gym. He does weights. You know. Uh, free weight strength training, resistance bands, treadmill. Um, you well, know, I try to, yeah. him, I haven't gotten him on the jump rope. He says he's not, uh, not yet. coordinated, but, um, but I'm working on it for sure. But they still travel a lot and, you know, they're active and hike and my dad and stepmom did Machu Picchu recently. Oh, wow. So, that's, that's a big undertaking. Yeah. So I tried to get them in shape for that. Um, but they were great. They did great. But, um, I have to say like my mom's, um, my mom's dad, my grandfather, he, uh, is, he just turned 101 in June. Oh my gosh. Wow. I know. And he said to me once, and I'll never forget it. He says, you can retire from work, but you can never retire from working out. Mm, that's interesting. That seems like it's carried through your whole family. It has, and he still works out. He goes to the gym, and he goes to physical therapy, and he does resistance bands now. But I asked him when I was down there in March. He's in Florida. Um, I said, you know, when's the – he's kind of in that, I guess, as anyone would be at 101, where you feel like you're on your – you know, the next step is 
dying, which not to be like a downer, but. <laughs> but practically speaking, yeah. Practically speaking. And he's a realist and all his friends are gone. And, you know, his siblings and, uh, you know, luckily he has great grandchildren and grandchildren. And, but um, I said, when was the last time you were really happy? And he said, when I was playing tennis and I said, well, when was that? He was like, well, I had to stop playing at 97. Oh my and, gosh. That is wow. But he had to stop playing because all his partners died. <laughs> oh, oh no. I'm sorry. That's, I know. I'm sorry. I really shouldn't laugh at that. No, that's I, like, he just outlived them all and outplayed them all. He outlived wow. them all. He outplayed them all. Him and his best friend, um, Dave, um, they were in like a, I mean, Dave unfortunately passed away this year, but he was, Dave was, I think had just turned 102 or turning 103. So they were in this, like, who's going to live longer? Both had lived, you know, have lived healthy lives. And my grandfather, you know, he, I think he would be happier in his life now if he could still, um, he said, you know, I'd love to still swim in the ocean or swim in the pool, but I don't want an entourage. And unfortunately he kind of needs an entourage if he's going to mm -hmm. do that now. Yeah, I have. Okay. So real quick, I do want to get into, I have a quick question about what you said earlier, but before we get there mm -hmm. for someone who's lived that long, I'm very curious about what choices he's made to, for that longevity, if there is any correlation or if it's just genes, I, I don't know, but I'm curious about two things. One, obviously, you know, food and food and yeah. sleep, but then also emotional. Like was he, did he choose a certain career that he was always happy with or, or something along those lines? You know, that's an interesting question. I tried to like record him, um, recently when I was down there just so that I could have some, cause he's sharp as a tack and, hasn't lost any of his faculties at all. Wow. So he remembers everything. And I think for him, my perspective is he's, he's not a man of many words. I have to ask him to get it out of him. But my grandmother, who is also still alive, she's 94. Oh my um, gosh. Wow. Yeah, not what she's mentally, she's, she's got dementia. So, um, she's not totally with it, but she was always the boisterous, loud, talkative, sort of, you know, center of attention in the room. And you always knew that when my grandfather said something, it was important because he didn't get a word in edgewise or otherwise. <laughs> That's funny. So I think for him, you know, I would say his life, it hasn't been easy, but he's a simple man. Like he was healthy. He worked out every day. He had the same job for, you know, he owned a packaging company for his entire career. So he didn't bounce around from jobs. Um, you know, not getting into politics cause you know, everybody differs. I even differ from him, but he's, you know, he believed in the, um, almost like a, he grew up in like a socialist mentality. Um, that, you know, you don't need everything, that everyone should have everything available, you hmm. know, without excess. Hmm. And so I think that's how he sort of lived his life. And he was active, obviously. He swam in the ocean every day. He played tennis all the time. Um, and he was also, I have to say, my, even when I was in college, I remember speaking to my grandparents and I felt like they had a bigger social life than I did. Oh, wow. <laughs> they wow. were always out with friends, you know, go, having dinner parties, going to a dinner party, going to the movies, going to a play. So I think that and reading, you know, kept his mind active. He's a reader and very interested in current events and the news. And he really kept himself up to date in everything pretty much. Um, but hmm. interesting. yeah. And even, you know, they lost a child. Um, my, my mom's brother died, but still, even through that, it's like he managed to sort of compartmentalize that, I guess, to keep going as I'm sure that it would be hard for many people to do that. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's, I was not expecting that. I'm very glad we went down that, down that path because that was very interesting. Wow. 
That's yeah, really I wasn't cool. expecting that either, but <laughs> I think yeah. So let, let's let's kind of wrap back around because I do have a sure. question about um, your skating because you said it was something to to keep striving towards. I'm curious what the variables were because I'm not familiar with that sport. What the variables were that you were pushing for and that you were training for? Well, so there were different levels that you had to pass. Um, there were tests essentially. Um, as well as competition. So certain, um, almost like, I don't know if you, it was called patch at the time, but they're like the figure eight, like compulsory events where you had to um, pass a test to pass, to move on to the next level. Mm. And then there were freestyle events, which is probably what you got, you're more familiar with and probably any of the listeners are more familiar with as well, which is your skating programs that you see on TV. Okay. Uh, program had to contain certain elements. Um, and you know, once you pass certain tests, you can move up and your program will have to contain, you know, more difficult elements. Um, and it's changed a lot actually over the last, I would say even 10 years, um, in terms of the way that they score skating. Cause it was very, I'm sure if you are familiar with at all, like when the, uh, Tanya Harding, um, Nancy Kerrigan debacle happened. Skating was a sport where it's all about where you came from, your status, how you looked, and the judges base, you know, could judge you however they wanted to. Were you elegant enough? Well, if you're not from a certain area or you're not, you don't look a certain way and you look like Tanya Harding and not Nancy Kerrigan, you were judged poorly. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So, Yeah. So basically judging, there was no sort of oversight at the time. Um, Sure, you had elements you had to pass, but, you know, it was very biased. Um, Now, I think, you know, I give them credit for changing it. Now it's very technical, which is great. But I also think because of the technicality of it now that it's lost a little bit of the artistry. Mm, Um, Interesting. But, you know, sometimes it's hard to have both. But, um, so yeah, I strive to, you know, keep getting better at it. And, you know, I was never, and I think being, um, this is sort of important for me because I think it goes with my personality type that I was great in practice. I, you know, no fear would jump up, try anything. Sure. I felt a lot. I was used to falling, you sort of get comfortable with it, um, I had many bruises for my <laughs> throughout my childhood. I would like freeze during competition, not freeze, but like I just couldn't get out of my head. So I struggled in competition a lot, which was frustrating. What do you, what do you mean freeze? Like so you're on the floor and you forget your ice. routines yeah. or No, no, not like that, but like you know how some people it's like you put them on a stage and they just light up and everything is it's like you see a personality in them that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. For me, I was like, I hated to be watched and judged and um, critiqued. I felt very uncomfortable with that. And it wasn't that I didn't have the skill to do it. I just wasn't able to let myself enjoy the competition of it. Did you, did you ever do any, take any specific steps or practice anything to overcome that? Or was that kind of just something that sat with you? Um, so a couple years I went to training camp or training camp at university of Delaware, which was a big training for, you know, very successful skaters where you had the top coaches. Um, and I, I think this was a little bit of a turning point for me. I was training with the same coach that Tara Lipinski trained with. And she at the time hadn't, nobody knew who she was, but she was sort of at a level that she was, I think about to go to the junior Olympics. I think she was probably, um, I don't know, maybe 10 at the time or 12. Wow. Wow. Um, That's young. I remember she won in 90, 98. So she was a couple years younger than me. Um, but she, I think was 
um, 15 years old when she won the Olympics. And she won at 15. Wow. Yeah, she won the gold at 15. She was the youngest ever. Wow. In That's the sport impressive. At the time. Unbelievable. But the, what was impressive about it was I had watched her like over and over that the, those two summers that I was there. And, you know, you had the skaters that were young like that, that the coaches were pushing and the moms were yelling, you know, from the sides of the rink. Um, and then Tara, she had this thing where she wouldn't get off the ice until she had landed whatever jump she was working on. She had to land it five times in a row. If she fell on the fourth one, she'd start over. And that is very I, intense. Very intense. And she was a kid. And I remember her mom saying, Tara, you know, we have a dentist appointment we have to go to. And she wouldn't get off the ice until she had landed it. And it was her will, you know, her determination. It wasn't her mother's or her coach. Um, and I sort of looked at her and I was like, that's what makes someone successful. Right. So yeah, that pure drive, the pure drive. Um, and you know, she had moved up from Texas. That's where her family was from her mom and her moved to an apartment near the rink in Delaware to train while her dad lived in Texas and help, you know, support them financially because obviously they saw something in her, but, um, that was a big lesson for me that it's that internal drive that moves you to that next level. And I think for me, it opened up a lot in my head. I came back and I remember my coach saying, you know, I feel like you changed. Like I was able to emote better and not be so in my head when I was competing. Hmm. So see seeing yeah. her kind of unlocked a new way of, dealing with freezing. Yeah. And just being, you know, comfortable in that space where it's not necessarily like, Oh my gosh, all eyes are on me, but, um, but I can do this. I can do it. It gave me like a confidence that I am the only one that can do it. So I have hmm. to do it. You know, I, I have a side question to that about how it relates to coaching now, but before we get there, I'm curious mm -hmm. when when you started um, jumping and if you did other versions of working out before you picked up a rope. Yes. So I've always been very um, active and at the gym and, you know, it was before all the fad, you know, all these boutique fitness craze came about. Um I would, you know, I would do off ice training, strength training with weights, with bands. Um, but I, I like for cardio, I would say I ran mostly and I've always hated it, <laughs> but I, always yeah, I understand it. that. <laughs> just, yeah. Like I just didn't find the joy in it. Um, but I did it cause I was always just trying to be healthy. And I, I was much more of like, you know, four miles, you know, banging out in as quick as I could do. Um, four miles is a lot. I never do more than one mile. <laughs> it's impressive. I mean, at the time I was doing like four miles, probably an eight minute. I was about 30 minutes. Um, and I'm like, okay, done. I've done it. My cardio is done. And that's sort of how I looked at it. So it wasn't very enjoyable running along with, um, my work, which I can go into, um, after, but I have arthritis in my neck and I, I just had like a bad injury that I couldn't shake and running with keeping my arms up, you know, running, it just, I couldn't do it. It was so uncomfortable for me that even if I could run the four miles, it just was difficult the whole time. So I stopped, I swam for a while and then I kind of got bored with that and I picked up the jump rope and I just was hooked. I felt like not only was, you know, I was able to do it, the basic bounce and the boxer bounce, but I felt like I could kind of zone out in a way that I couldn't when I was either on a stationary piece of equipment or outside. I felt like I was like, I, I, I think I mentioned this to you earlier. Like it was almost like a meditation. Mm -hmm. 
Like you were in a flow. Yeah. And I could enjoy the music I was listening to. Um, and then, you know, starting to try, you know, I felt like I was kind of dancing with the rope and it became fun, like just like a dance party with the rope <laughs> and then learning tricks. And, you know, I can't say that I've gotten too far in the trick arena, but not for lack of trying. <laughs> well, I think also it's just a different, it's a different style too. You also don't need that many freestyle or freestyle skills in your back pocket. If you know, like it sounds like you're going there to jump continuously for quite a while, you know, for like a full workout, you actually yeah. don't need that many skills. Like if you're doing high level, like triple unders or a lot of like push ups or all this stuff, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're, you're cutting down your workout time because you have to rest, you know, and exactly. You gotta keep I your mean, heart rate at a certain spot. So I, I was doing a lot of interval stuff too. And, um, I sort of started playing around with the jump rope, um, doing intervals of cardio and then using the jump rope in my strength training. I had kind of gotten bored with, I had been doing weight training and strength training for so long that I needed to like change it up a little bit, but mm -hmm. feel like I could get the same type of push and sweat and get my heart rate up, but also feel that I was, you know, leaning or toning my muscles in the way that I could with dumbbells or with kettlebells. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that's when I started playing around with the jump rope and using it for different things. I did find that, and I lived in New York city at the time. Um, I was living there for almost 17 years and time is money in New York, right? So <laughs> yep, <laughs> I started doing all this research on jump rope and the efficiency of it. And that became more important to me. It was like, oh my gosh, I can do what I was doing in an hour and a half in a half hour with the jump rope very, in terms yeah, of calorie burn mm -hmm. work, you know? Um, and there were so many other benefits that we can go into as well, but that made me like, I was hooked. I'm like, why would I do something for an hour and a half when I can do it for a half hour and get the same results? Mm -hmm. I'm curious too, you said you had a, a neck injury. I'm wondering if that kind of predisposed you to have a little bit better form because if you, you said during running, you couldn't keep your arms up. So you had to naturally relax them. I, I would imagine that has helped tremendously because that's one of the biggest issues that I see when I'm coaching people on jump rope is their arms are rigid and tight. I'm sure you see the same thing. And once 100%. they relax them, it gets a, a lot better. A hundred percent. Um, I think that's, you know, most people, especially people that work at a desk all day, you keep a lot of that tension in your traps and your neck and your shoulders. I, I worked on a trading desk for 13 years and I, That'll felt do it. <laughs> my shoulders were like glued to my ears, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, that I actually took a, I had a private yoga teacher who it was like, through the several years of private training, like tried to get me out of that, um, tension, you know? So yeah, I do see that a lot. And with jump rope, I feel that my upper body is much more relaxed. You know, if you can just focus on the wrists, I don't have to worry about my neck or my shoulders at all. I also tend to, co um, like use a cue about elbows too. I find when people use their, cause the elbows tend to drive a lot of that wrist motion. When I tell sure. people, Hey, you know, drive, drive your elbows, like a car piston drives down it, like it clicks for them. And that seems to be like a solid, solid way to go. Yeah, that's good. I always tell people at the beginning class, you know, like shake it out, relax, shake the it biceps, out. Mm -hmm. relax the shoulders, you know, roll out your head, shake your neck out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that for everybody these days has been, everybody sort of is so, you know, their shoulders are at their ears. Everyone's so tense. tense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how did you go from picking up the rope and using it for you to then coaching? Because you're doing a lot now coaching, right? I am. I, um, so I was still working in finance at the time. Um, and I was just doing these workouts for myself 
at the gym at a gym that I'd gone to for a million years. And I would see the same people all the time and the same manager and, you know, everyone would comment, you know, you should really do a class. You should really do a class. And, um, it was sort of at the time when, um, all these in New York, at least all these, and I'm sure in California as well, all these boutique fitness studios were popping up. You know, you had the soul cycle and the Barry's Boot Camp and the flywheel and the surf set, you know, where you can simulate surfing. I mean, there were like every single thing you can imagine, like the dance cardio and the hit training and all that stuff, but nothing other than boxing had jump rope. And I thought there's definitely um, an avenue here that hasn't been tapped into that people don't realize how efficient it is. But I think there's a little bit of a stigma that it's either for schoolgirls on the playground mm-hmm. or it's for boxers. Yep. The boxer is intimidating to the person who doesn't box. The rest of them say, you know, I haven't, I haven't jumped since I was in elementary school. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So I feel like it was an avenue that hadn't been tapped into that people just needed to learn about. But if somehow I could make it on, I know this sounds sort of lame. I can't believe I'm even saying it, but if I could make it a trendy workout Mm -hmm. the way that all these other workouts are, people would try it and then they'd be hooked. And that's all I really wanted to do was get them in the door because I knew that if, I could get them in the door and they, if they had the mentality that I have where don't give up after the first time, but because you weren't great, come back again and come back for a third time. And after the third time, it's like, wow, you know, this is awesome. A hundred percent. And I kind of look at it like, um, I picked up snowboarding when I was, gosh, how old was I? 32, maybe 33. And I had skied most of my life and had never tried snowboarding. And I felt like, what kind of skill can I learn that's different that I'll be challenged by? I felt like I wasn't really challenged with anything at the time. And I picked it up and I went and (laughs) it was a rough two days, but then it just clicked. And once it clicked, I felt like I was floating and it was like, ah, this all makes sense now. And so I kind of use that analogy with jump rope that you just need to give it the amount of time to sort of let it click, let it yourself not only get the form, but like to feel the rhythm of it and let your body sort of adjust. And it's not going to happen the first time and probably not the second, but it might the third and it might the fourth. And once it does, I feel like everyone... I feel like everyone should love it the way that I do. And I think everyone would, but it's that, you know, you have that beginner mentality. Are they, are they going to stick with it? And that's what I try to, you know, help people in my class to do is to stick with it because I, you know, try to tell them that they will get the results that they want, not necessarily physically, but that, you know, that frustration goes away. What's interesting about that too is that same principle applies to the rest of the you know single rope freestyle skills or really any freestyle skill, even when it's double dutch or anything else, because that same block that you're talking about happens over and over and over when you yeah. level up. And and I felt it many times, even you know, even this week when I've been jumping, right? Same thing. There's always a skill or a sequence or something to be working on that is just out of reach. But like you're saying, if you just keep chipping away at that practice and putting in the reps, you will get there. Totally. And, you know, I, as an adult, I think it's much easier as a kid to be driven that way. Um, in skating, you know, sure. When I learned doubles and triples, you're going to fall a million times and it's frustrating but you have to get back up and you have to try it again. Um, and I think as a kid, you're sort of, it's, you know, it's ingrained in you to just try again, to try again, try again. As an adult, it's like, Oh, it's too hard. I'm not going to do it anymore. So 
I try to get people out of that mentality that it's only for people that are coordinated. Mm-hmm. No, it's for everybody. Everybody's for coordinated. If you, if you commit and you want to do it, you'll do it. And, and it comes down to practice. Totally. And you're a hundred percent better when you walk out of the first class than you were when you walked in, regardless of where you started. Mm-hmm. Every single time. I'm cu- I'm curious too. So you mentioned when you were, you know, on the competition floor feeling uncomfortable with all eyes on you for, for a while, how did that play out when you started coaching people? It's funny that you asked that. I was so nervous when I first started teaching classes. Um, when I was a kid, my mom was an aerobics teacher and I called her and I was like, were you really nervous? The first class that you taught, like, that you were going to screw up or that it wasn't going to flow. And she's like, honestly, I don't really remember. (laughs) She's like, it was so long (laughs) ago, but, um, she's like, but that goes away. You, you know, Mm -hmm. you're good at what you do and you know, you just need to feel confident and it doesn't matter if it's not perfect. No one else is going to know it's not perfect. That is so true. Oh my gosh. Let's just underscore that for a second for anyone who's ever going to coach any series or continuously coach any classes, that point right there, if you know what you're talking about and if you are an expert at what you do, like yourself, then no one's going to know. They're just literally not going to know if you said the wrong word, the wrong term, if you went out of order, right. any of that. Right. You know, I I guess I'm a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to, you know, if I'm leading a class or leading an event, I want it to be perfect. And at the end of the day, I'm the only one that is going to know if it's perfect or not. So, um, you know, I have to give myself a little bit of leeway, but, um, yeah, I for sure was nervous. Um, now I feel like I could do it with my eyes closed. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. After all that practice, what, when was your first class actually? Um, my first class was in New York, uh, I want to say probably in 2017. I think it was um, maybe August of 2017. Okay. Yeah. I just did a pop-up before I started teaching at a gym there. Um, And it was great. I mean, I had like a couple missed, like the room, the place that I had the space I had rented, the door was locked. I couldn't get in. I had to go to a different, you know, studio in the same location. So it was like everything that could go wrong went wrong. Oh no. (laughs) But nobody knew, you know, and it was totally fine. Um, And you're walking around like everything's totally good guys. Just give me like two more minutes. (laughs) Right. Exactly. I mean, I still have that when now when I'm teaching classes, whether it's a jump rope class or a strength and conditioning class, I'm not always as prepared or my playlist is new and I don't necessarily know exactly how I'm going to lead it. But again, I'm the only person that knows. Yep. That's so cool that you you made that complete transition. I'm I'm curious, like over the years, have you seen anything change uh, in in two regards? Have you seen anything change Mm -hmm. in fitness and have you seen anything change in jump rope? Um, Fitness for sure. I mean, like I said, because I was sort of privy to the fitness world at such a young age. Um, you know, obviously my mom was an aerobics teacher. I mean, it's funny, you don't really see aerobics anymore, but you're seeing, you know, you see the Zumba and the cardio mm-hmm. dance, which is a variation of that. Um everyone was very was all about the gym before. Now it's all about the experience. It's all about the boutique fitness. Um, you know, if it's soul cycle, the lights are out and the candles are on. If it's Mm -hmm. yoga, it's these retreats in like beautiful places. It's, um, everyone's more about the experience, which is great. Um, but it's also become extremely oversaturated, at least in New York, it was oversaturated. Um, you would literally be on a single block and you'd have, um, rumble boxing, Peloton, biking, a yoga studio and an orange theory all lined up next to each other, Oh wow! but they all did well. 
And, and that's the crazy part because people right now, I think the attention span in general of this day and age with social media and digital, the attention span is much shorter. So people want quick results and they want, uh, they don't want to get bored and they're not going to work themselves out unless they have a trainer and a lot of people can't afford a trainer. So the group fitness sort of filled that, um, part of the fitness industry where you could pay less. You don't have to pay a personal trainer, but have the experience of it and somewhat be social at the same time. Um, just as a side note, when I was in finance, I was a trader. So I was on the buy side, which meant uh, the salespeople would, you know, pitch me trades, but they would also have, I was the client. So they would have to take me out and, Typically on Wall Street, it was taking you out to steak dinners and, you know, drinks and, you know, not the healthiest environment. Mm -hmm. But in the last, I would say, eight years, um, it's changed a lot. And so the my coverage would call me and say, do you want to take um, a spin class or do you want to take a boot camp class? And then we'll go for dinner afterwards. And that was interesting. Much, wow. Yeah. And that was like much more enjoyable for me because I wanted to work out at least four or five days a week. That was sort of the commitment I had always made to myself. And so I would either not go out as with for work um, as often as I should because I wanted to get a workout in or I would go with work, you know, and be social and get my workout in, but then also, you know, sort of kill two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. Um, so the benefit of, I think what's changing is the millennials. I am older than a millennial. Um, I hate to say it, but I, am. <laughs> I just turned 40, which I still can't believe I'm saying, but, um, I, the millennials, they are much more, especially like in New York, when your finances are really tight and you're, everyone's living on a budget because you're in these tiny, tiny apartments. Mm -hmm. Everything costs a million dollars. They're, they would be more willing to spend their money on um, fitness. Interesting. Huh. Which has changed a lot from the time that I started in finance. So, you know, you're definitely getting the millennials that they want to eat healthy, they're willing to do the diet programs, whether it's like, you know, the food delivery, Saqqara or blue, whatever it is. I don't even know, but, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like Hello Fresh and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. They're willing to spend money on that and then cut back on, um, drinking and partying kind of hmm. thing. Interesting. Um, because they can go as a social crew to a class together. And so they're sort of getting the social aspect of it without having to spend money on alcohol. Hmm. I don't know if that's how it is everywhere, but that's sort of the change that I saw over the years in New York. And I'm seeing that here as well. Not as much in Chicago because I'm in the Midwest, so everybody loves their steak and potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, gotta have that locked down, right? Good old steak and potatoes. Exactly. Exactly. What, um, what advice do you have for someone who's trying to start a fitness class? Because you've built yours up from the grounds from the ground up, right? Well, um, it's, I would say don't expect it to be easy. I, <laughs> number know, one, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> it is not going to be easy and don't have, you know, the illusions that it will. Um, I, you know, I sort of decided, I, I can't say on a whim, but I never thought I would leave New York. I was in finance. Things were great. And then all of a sudden one day I woke up, I'm like, I hate my job. I love the people I work with, but I hate my job. And I, fitness is my passion. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And I mm -hmm. got my NASM certification and I moved as quickly as possible to start teaching classes um, but you know, I say that there's always, uh, you know, positives and negatives, the negatives, not having a corporate job. I don't have 
health insurance. Mm-hmm. I don't have paid time off. Mm-hmm. You know, all that stuff that you take for granted when you have it. I used to have, you know, nine weeks of paid vacation. And now any vacation I'm paying double basically because I'm yeah. not working. Because you're not working exactly. Yeah. And health insurance it's like a racket. We, you know, that is another for another Mm -hmm. day and it's a hustle. You know, you have to, it's so saturated that you have to show why you are different. Um, which is the jump rope gave me somewhat of a different route to take than what everybody else is doing right now, because it's just not saturated the way everything else is. So I've been lucky in that aspect, but that doesn't mean that, um, I feel like I said to my mom today, I feel like I'm just, and not that I'm tired, you know, like tired, tired. I'm just tired. Like I, I, it's like hustling and hustling and hustling and there's no end. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and my grandfather even said, he's like, that's, that's the life of a new business owner. It's the life of an entrepreneur you're going to be tired all the time because every single thing that you do has to go into propelling it to the next level. If that's what you want, whether it's the marketing aspect of it, um, the physical aspect of it, obviously, you know, I have to teach a certain amount of classes a day and be physically able to do it. You know, I can't have an injury. I have to focus yeah. on recovery, which I don't do enough of. That's a big deal. And yeah, it's a huge deal and it's expensive. Mm-hmm. So, you know, not just the foam rolling and um, icing and all that stuff, but like whether it's dry needling or massage or if you get an injury, having to take care of it, you know, it it definitely throws a wrench in, in the everyday. So it's a grind and you have to be willing to do the grind. That's my biggest advice. And also, oh, another piece of great advice that someone told me, you have to be willing to pivot because mm-hmm. it may not go the way you had planned, but that's okay. And make changes when you need to. So I'm, I'm curious what's worked to help you keep clients, but real quick, while I let that sit there for a second, can you describe dry needling what it is. And I'm really curious what your experience is with it because I've seen it before. I've never had it done on me personally though. Oh my God. I love it. Yeah. It's like, so if I go into a massage and they say, what pressure do you want? I say as hard as you can, (laughs) because I feel like with my neck and my back and my shoulders from being at a desk for so many years, um, I have like knots that just don't go away. So Mm -hmm. what dry needling is you're taking that, um, I guess essentially the tender spot. So if you have a muscle that you push into and it feels like almost like, um, not just, uh, tight, but it's like a pressure point. Like it's going to send you like a nerve, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that's where they, Yeah. And, um, something that is sort of the, the central point that may lead to tightness in other areas. Um, if you find that point where it's tender, um, the dry needling is it's tiny little needles similar to acupuncture, but acupuncture just sits on the top of your skin, sort of, um, dry needling. They actually stick the needle into your muscle and, the mutt and they sort of jiggle it around a little. I know it sounds sort of weird that it's, it's such a slim, uh, needle, but they jiggle it around a little bit until the muscle sort of twitches. And then all of a sudden the muscle releases and it's this crazy sense of relief. I mean, it's like having a massage 12 times, but you're finally at that outcome that you wanted. It's letting, it's getting rid of that knot that you couldn't get rid of. And I have so many of those. And uh, when I was living in New York and I had amazing health insurance, I would do dry needling three times a week. Oh my, wow. Uh, that's really frequent. Yeah. Well, because it, they, they say that you can't do it too often if you have knots that you can't get rid of. Right. 
why not do it, right? It'll release the muscle and let go of all that tension. Unfortunately, my insurance now doesn't cover it. So. Oh no, <laughs> that's a bummer. I know, I know. Which is so crazy because I feel like my job relies on it. Sure, I can maybe write it off, but but yeah. So it's if you have those like um, really tough knots that you can't release, I think dry needling is amazing for it. My dad does it too. It's a great alternative to the consistency of like having a massage all the time and not necessarily getting the results that you want. I'm going to actually link up a video in the show notes because I, uh, I've hung out with uh, Scott Panchik who's one of the CrossFit games athletes is a phenomenal guy just as a human being, but he was doing a vlog some time ago. I forget exactly when, but there's a vlog of his, on, of his training and part of his training, he goes in to do a dry needling session and he, they're doing uh-huh. it on his quads. And so he's sitting there with, you know, his shorts rolled up and they're dry needling his uh-huh. quads and he, the face he makes, it's not that long of a clip, but he just starts laughing and it's just like the, for him, the strangest feeling. Um, and I would imagine it's very weird the first time or two you do that. It is. And you have to go to someone who really like knows the body and knows exactly where they're putting the needle. Not that it's, I I mean, you have to be trained for it, obviously to do it. And I think some States haven't gotten there yet. I know Chicago just, um, allowed, started allowing it. So people have gotten trained, you know, if they stick it in the the muscle and it's not exactly where that tender trigger point is, it's not going to give you the relief you want. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to necessarily hurt you, but you really want it to be in exactly the right place. And then it, it really is. It's like such a relief. Let's kind of like go back to, because I mean, believe me, I would, I would love to talk about dry needling for like, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> like several shows, because I think that and other methods, it's just so interesting, the amount of recovery you can do with your body. And I'm learning, I'm continuing to learn more and more about it. And yeah, that's a subject we could go on for a very long time, <laughs> but I am Recovery curious. Is like a whole other topic. There's so many things to do, and it's just as important as your workout, if not more. Hundred percent, yeah. And I wish that I was. I mean, I know that, but I just don't focus on it enough. Mm-hmm. But I should. What um? So what was it, or what has been working for you to keep clients and keep your classes going and growing? Um, you know, it's interesting. In, um, I think I had mentioned to you when we first spoke that, uh, moving from New York to Chicago, um, I've been now in Chicago for about a year and a half and, um, there, it, there was a, I felt that the fitness industry here was a little bit different in the sense that people weren't as ready to try new new things as they were on the coast, whether it be California or New York. Um, they were sort of resistant to change and comfortable in what they did. Um, you know, like I said, meat and potatoes and, you know, go to the gym, maybe try a Barry's boot camp. but Barry's has been around for 10 years and it's just, you know, starting to get popular the last mm-hmm year or two years in Chicago. Um, you know, same thing with soul cycle and things like that. Um, so my biggest struggle was getting people in the door. Once I got them in the door, the feedback I've had has been amazing. Like it was the best workout I've ever had. I haven't sweat that much. I haven't been so challenged. I feel like I was mentally had to be present, which, you know, a lot of people said, you know, having, to mentally be there for the coordination part of it. Um, they felt, you know, they were extremely uncoordinated, but they also haven't checked into a workout mentally in a long time. So, Interesting. so they were there physically, but they weren't really invested in what they were doing. Right. And I said, you know, well, if you're not present in jump rope, you're going to trip, right? <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> right. <laughs> or get a so, really gnarly whip. Exactly. So you can, I call them battle wounds, you know, you can be on a treadmill and run for miles. You can run for 10 miles and you don't have to be thinking about, you can be anywhere else in your mind with jump rope. 
like I said, it's a form of meditation. You have to be present. You have to be on rhythm. You have to pay attention. You know, I continue. I do a lot of counting for my classes, especially beginners on that eight count rhythm. Cause I think if they can get on that, I, I, I tell them if you get annoyed at my voice, just count to yourself. I don't care if you're on my count or your own count, but I just want you to count. I feel like I'm always counting when I'm jumping, not out loud, but in my head, you know, I try to pick music that is going to help them with that and music that they like as well. So um, hopefully the playlist is another reason why they stay um, or come back. So you're, so you're hustling really, really hard to get them in the door, which is number one, or actually arguably number two, because I, I think what's really keeping them around is the fact that you have a high quality course in class and there's a lot for you to offer them. I would say that's maybe number one. I hope that's the case. Yeah. So most of my clients that come to class, they're regulars. And so I always love when I get somebody new because I know once they do it, they'll be hooked. If they have that mentality, like we talked about, where you're willing to put the work in. Mm -hmm. I do. I really believe in it. I'm passionate about it. I think it's extremely efficient time-wise, calorie-wise for, you know, the feel-good part of it. But there are so many um, reasons, you know, it helps improve bone density. It's great for, you know, aging women, especially coordination, agility, quickness. I mean, everything that you want as you get older, that I think we don't pay enough attention to in fitness, I think is really important. And there, you know, like I said, we can list a million reasons why the jump rope, why I believe the jump rope is the best form of Mm -hmm fitness but what do you and it's fun yeah it also comes down to the fact that you're just having a great time doing it it's so fun and it's like you continuously can be challenged with a new trick to make cardio not feel like cardio yeah i think i said in a previous episode i was chatting with i think i was chatting with someone or doing a q a or something but jump rope's really funny and unique i think it's unique in that there's always something that you that you can be proud of that you have accomplished and you can do right now, but there's always something to push for next. Totally. I mean, I feel that even, you know, people look at me and my class and I, oh, I can't believe you, you can do this and you can talk at the same time. And I look at videos and I'm like, gosh, I wish I could do that. And I will do that. I just, you know, need to keep practicing. But yeah, I mean, it it is. It's a fun challenge. Um, There's always something to strive for. I feel like I I really love when someone, like when someone in my class does a crossover for the first time or a double Mm under, seeing their face, like they're so excited, you know? It's such a good feeling. It's almost like you just got it for the first time again too. Totally, totally. I love it. Um, I love it for them. I love it for me. And then I know, I know after they get it, they're going to be back. Yeah. They're hooked, you know? Yep. Exactly. What, what, are you, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish in the future with Jump Rope? You know, I don't know. I feel like I'm a little bit at a crossroads right now. Um, it's been a year and a half since I've been in Chicago and doing this, and I'm really trying to broaden it. So like I had mentioned to you, I want to start taking it on the road a little bit and doing some pop-ups in different cities. I want people to really learn why I love what I love and sort of be involved in it and not just watch it on Instagram or, you know, YouTube and to find that love that I have for it. Um, And I think that sort of doing that and moving across the country and, and getting to know people and what, types of fitness they're involved in. I think it's kind of a fun way to do that. So I'd love to grow it that way. And then, you know, here in Chicago, I'm getting involved in as many things as possible. I did um, an event with Under Armour recently in their flagship. I'm doing another Which one. Is really in October. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. I mean, the turnout was amazing. The feedback was amazing. They invited me to do it again in October, which I'm so grateful for. They're doing this whole, I don't know if you've heard of a sweat life. It's, um, I haven't, 
actually? It's a Chicago, it's a local company. Um, they sort of started this online destination for all things fitness and lifestyle, health, wellness. Sort of almost, I would say it started as a blog to say like where the best fitness classes were, where, you know, w- nutrition articles, all that sort of thing. And then they started to really get the community together and, you know, they have a trainers connect, which all the trainers in all of Chicago can come to a certain location at a different studio and get to know each other and have a good workout. Whether I like that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, and try a different workout than they're what, what they're used to. And they also have ambassadors throughout the country, a sweat life ambassadors and, you know, people that want to just find other friends and network in the fitness community, which I think is really great. Cause sometimes, you know, I know for me, my friends don't all work out the way that I do. So it's nice mm-hmm. to have workout friends and they've sort of set up a way to have events so that you can meet those people and really network. Um, and they're starting this new, or they started recently this new like PE nation. So it's like every month they do something that is kind of a throwback to at least when I was in high school, you know, whether it's dodgeball or, you know, capture the flag or basketball or anything to sort of get everyone together and team oriented. Um, but they really want to bring jump rope into that because oh, nice. everybody jumped rope. Yeah. Yep. On the school yard. So I'm doing, um, some big events with them coming up and I think that it'll really sort of help to, I don't know, get, um, jump rope out into more of a mainstream fitness community that it's not a part of right now. Yeah. That is, yep, that'd be really cool to get that moving too. I feel that that same goal. That's definitely something that's been been on my mind a lot too. <laughs> I mean, you probably see it because like, I mean, I know CrossFit does a lot of stuff, but I don't think CrossFit does as much of the freestyle stuff. No, they don't. They usually stick to usually, um, actually, I don't think I've ever seen anything. I personally haven't seen anything programmed other than um double unders and triple unders and then single unders are also in there for a scaled option. Um, right. but other than that, the only other variation I've seen is heavy ropes. Uh, but yeah, no, no freestyle, no, no, um, freestyle skills. Right. And I think, you know, people also are intimidated by CrossFit and the double unders. It's like, you kind of have to start from the bottom, right? The basic bounds and the boxer bounds and, we don't need to like dive into the double unders. Well, you know, you 50 know, or 100 double unders. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with that. That's definitely how um, our methodology is kind of structured is to start with first principles and build from there. So you actually have a foundation. But right. many, many CrossFitters um, start with doubles. And in fact, <laughs> I it's actually very common and very normal to meet someone who can do double unders, but cannot do a single under or a boxer bounce, right? Or a boxer bounce. Exactly. Yeah. I see it all the time. I'm not knocking CrossFit, but I'm just of another wave of the jump rope than that. I would rather focus on the skills, the foundation, the form, you know, the form, the rhythm and all the other benefits of it. And if you can do a double under, that's great. That's awesome. If you can do a triple under even better, but Um, there are so many benefits of it, even if you can't do any of that stuff Mm -hmm. and different purpose of working out too. Totally. So I think this is probably, I mean, we've covered, oh my gosh, this has been so (laughs) far and beyond what I was expecting. I'm so excited. This has been so cool. And we talked about dry needling. So that is like immediately a thumbs up for me. Gold star. (laughs) I'm pumped that we went over that. Um, but I think we'll kind of head to the, the last question here uh, that I ask everyone and We've definitely touched on elements of it, but I'm curious, what is jump rope to you? Um, I would say for me, it's, um, and I mentioned it, it's my form of meditation. I do meditate and I've been trying to get better at it. I think it's good for everybody. And I was always very resistant to it because I'm like, I don't want to be alone with the thoughts in my head, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I've sort of 
gotten past that. And I think for me, jump rope is a great addition to just a basic form of meditation. You have to be present. I'm able to be present while jumping and learning new skills and challenging myself and getting a good workout, a sweat, burning calories, all that stuff, but also really enjoying it um, and not feeling like it's work, feeling like it's a mental break and a physical break when it's not really a break at all. Right. I really enjoy it. I just, I feel like it's, it's a good escape, even though you're present, it's a good escape. Well, I've really enjoyed this whole conversation because Me too. you just hit the nail on the head with all of it. It's been so good. I'm really pumped too for, we're going to have to do a round two. I feel like at some point I'm going to have to round two like everyone I talk to and especially you because you have so much coming up. Um, yeah, it's, I, I can't wait to see where you are with jump rope classes and everything else you've got going you. on. You know, it's going to be really can't exciting. Wait to park up and do something in San Diego. Absolutely. Absolutely. That'd That's going to be a really good time. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Thank you again for taking the time and being on the show. And uh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was great. We're going to catch up with you for that round two. All right. I'll be waiting for it. Can't wait.